Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to thank uh, our guest today is Joy Osmansky. Uh, Joy, I know from uh, one of my new favorite shows that I review every week, Stargirl. Um, but we're going to talk about your role there and some other uh, things you've been working on. Um, but to start, I've been I've been reviewing Stargirl since it since it came out. I've really enjoyed it. Um, but for people who haven't tuned in yet, can you tell us about your character on Stargirl? <laughs> So my character is unlike anything I've ever played before. Uh, she's a dual character. So she has a very a public persona, Paula Brooks, uh, who teaches at the local high school, coaches. And uh, then her, her private, or I might venture, real side <laughs> yeah. is Tigress. <laughs> is Tigress, and that's her supervillain side. Um, and that's the, that's the take action, kick everyone's ass side. Um, but... Uh, Playing both sides of this character has been really, really satisfying for me, um, particularly within the world of Stargirl, which Jeff has created so beautifully. So what, if anything, did you know about the character of Stargirl or DC Comics in general before going for this part? Thankfully, very little. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think if I had known, if I had understood the legacy of the character, I would have been really intimidated and burdened by that in a way that wouldn't have been helpful for me in an audition. You know, after you get a role, when you're, when you're lucky to get a role, that's when you really get to deep dive into some information, if it's helpful. It isn't always, it isn't always helpful to you in an acting process. But um, after I got the role, which I had no idea it was a dual role, uh, I think the audition sides were a code name, so I didn't even know that her name was Paula. I had no idea. Oh, really? And did when you I, know it was got, uh, yeah. Tigress? Or did they no. just say action hero or something? You didn't know. It didn't even say that. It just <laughs> said it just said that she, I think it said she was a parent uh, of, of a student at a local high school. That's all I knew. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I, I knew nothing. And I um, the sides were really fun. And, and it was clear that she was a bit sociopathic and violent, but you know, that's true for a lot of parents of high school. Right. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I'm joking, but, but I, I didn't know anything about her. And so after I booked the role, my agent sent me the real information and I thought there had been a mistake. I was like, this isn't what I auditioned for. And I have no idea who Tigress, I was like, who is that? No idea. Well, one um, of the things I like about Stargirl is the, the casting in general is, is against your superhero type. So it, it looks like they have yeah. the approach of going for the best actor as opposed to who's going to be a, you know, fit the superhero mold or something. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. I think. Well, thank you. Um, and then I certainly believe me, though, I did a little panic when I was like, I have to play a super. OK, I'm going to start exercising right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, def I definitely had had a, a, a moment of realness <laughs> with that. But no, you're right. I think Jeff approached this from an acting standpoint, from assembling, you know, like they do on screen, the, how they all assemble together as a team. He really assembled a team of creative people in all departments that was, a, was an absolute pleasure to work with. So, and that was a very deliberate thing that he did, um, which I was very grateful for. So I'm fascinated by the fact that they kind of hid from you what you were going to be before you got the role. But when you find oh, out- Oh, they never Tigress trust us. Oh, yeah, they don't trust actors. <laughs> actors can't keep their mouth shut. And I get it. I wouldn't try, you know, I, and I, again, I'm so glad I didn't know because after I got the true information and I looked it up, you know, it was just one little Google search and I was like, whoa, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, oh my God, there's a huge legacy here. And this character has been around for decades and I'm really glad I didn't know that. So once you get the role, I know you get scripts. I'm not in the, in the movie biz or TV biz, but I'm assuming you get scripts. Do the writers also assign you, like, here are the essential Tigress comics, or do they kind of trust you to read the script and interpret it on your own? Yeah, you know, I, I went back and forth a little bit with that, and I did read just a little bit of the comic book world of this character, and that was a fun that was a fun thing to see just other iterations of her. But um, beyond that, I didn't do too much because again, um, that's something the more as a, just a reader that I would enjoy. But if I am going to inhabit this character, then it doesn't necessarily help me, the actor, to know all the different versions of her that have been played because all I can do is bring myself to it and trust Jeff that what I can bring is valuable. So. I, I just focused on that 
for the most part. And the writers are so wonderful. And, and like any great writing team, once they see what you're capable of and what you can do, then they really start to tailor it for you. And, um, but she was very clearly written from the get-go. So Tigress to me is a very interesting character and you touched on this earlier with that duality because she's clearly a villain. She's not nice, she's excessively violent. Um, but she's also a mother yeah. who, at least so far, appears to really care for her child, which you don't see a lot in um, action movies in that kind of side of, especially villains. True. So uh, I believe you have children. How does that background for you prepare for this role, if at all? Oh, it absolutely does. And it made clicking into to Paula Tigress as a parent so natural and easy. And also was a lovely motivation for what she does, because you're right, there's a lot of times where these kinds of characters are very tunnel vision and they're driven by their, their sadistic desires and their need for violence. And I get that too. Um, but uh, having an added dimension of her being a parent who was passionate about the well being of her child, yeah, that was a really nice uh, addition to the character and certainly. I, something I could relate to immediately. I would not oh, behave. Look, she's not relating to the uh, homicidal. <laughs> no, <tendencies. Just> the <laughs> no. <laughs> I want to make it very clear that I I am not a helicopter parent, and I am not what I've termed her as being like a drone parent. Like she's <laughs> right there. <laughs> she's a, I'm I'm not like that at all. So, um, but yeah, those those fundamental things about being a parent though are certainly relatable. So you mentioned earlier about how when you figured out you were going to be a supervillain, you had to kind of start working out. So I'm going to kind of circle back to that. There was a particularly excellent fight scene between Tigress and Sportsmaster and the Justice Society a few episodes. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, how much of that do you have to do and how much of that is stunt people? Because this was a, a high octane fight scene for TV. I mean, I was very impressed. Yes, thank you for saying that. I, I, I too. Think you know which one like I'm talking about. Oh yeah, and you know, Neil and I, who plays Sportsmaster, we saw the previs, which Walt and his team had put together. And I think this technology is relatively new and the fact that the show used it was, was really helpful, especially to us as actors, we don't, we're not stunt people. And so for us to conceptualize a massive fight scene like that is going to be impossible unless we can see the arc of the entire storytelling of that scene. And um, <laughs> yeah, when we watched it, I was like, we're doing that um, <laughs> now Lauren Mary Kim who is my stunt double who is absolutely incredible and has an amazing career she held my hand through all of that fight and there is very specific stunt work that is her specialty all the wire work that is that is her ex area of expertise and I remember really naively thinking at some point before we started I was like wire work that looks like fun <laughs> and that, like I had any clue about what I was talking about. and then at one point I remember sitting in the hair and makeup trailer and Lauren came in and she had just done a bunch of wire work and she was covered in bruises never complained never even mentioned it but if that had been me I would have been like I need a, a quiet dark place to lie down and please don't talk to me for a week so I that's what I realized I I'm gonna stick to what I do <laughs> And she's going to help me and guide me through all of that. And then I'm going to let her shine and just be brilliant in the stuff that she does. And um, I did more than I expected, but it is intense physical work that professionals should be trusted with. Uh, I think I read in your, in your background, you have a, maybe a background in ballet in the past. Does yeah. that, that help at all with some of this? I mean, you have some of the action stuff. I mean, have you gotten a punch somebody or do something where you felt like I've kind of got some training for this. Oh yeah. The dance training has, was immeasurably helpful because it gave me a sense of my body and space. And sometimes with this stunt work, you know, you're, you're making decisions that have inches involved for camera angles and things like that. And so having an awareness of that and also the ability to learn choreography was really helpful. And I haven't been a dancer in practice for years, but it was nice to see that that stuff was still ingrained in me. And um, I was really happy that, that Walt was able to make use of it. And it was, it meant I could do a lot more than I expected, which was really fun. So while we're on the subject of background, I believe you also have a connection to the city of San Diego. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I went to grad school at UCSD. Both my husband and I went to grad school there and um, yep, up on the beautiful hilltops of La Jolla there. 
So, so I, yeah, three years. Yeah. Ultimate nerd question, which is, have you ever been to Comic Con? And no. You haven't? Would you go for Star Girl when it comes back? Would you go? I, of, of course. Oh my God. Of course. I need to get you well, on a panel. Absolutely. There. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's fun because um, the other show that I'm doing, the animated show, we are actually doing a panel for Comic Con that I think airs tomorrow. Oh, on the virtual con, yeah. Yeah, so it was like a tiny dip of the toe into what I know is supposed to be an incredible experience. You will um, have no idea. You, if you get the opportunity to actually go for a live panel, you know, hopefully when this COVID thing ends, you definitely need to take that opportunity because it's, it's crazy. Oh, I would love that. I would, I would love that. I would love to meet and interact with fans who, who thus far have been really incredible. And uh, this is, you know, my first experience with, any kind of content that has an existing fan base in this way. And people are amazing, creative, doing these amazing edits of the characters. And yeah, it's, it's really fun. Hot tip. You need to dress in your actual tigress <laughs> outfit and walk around and see if oh. A, recognize you or B, say that is the best tigress. You look just like the character. <laughs> from the that happens. So just, that's a hot tip for me. Uh, keep okay. that in your mind. Okay. Um, so without getting into spoilers, because you mentioned actors are horrible at keeping secrets, what can you tell me about, can you give me a hint as to what's in store for Tigress and Sportsmaster going forward? I've seen this well, week's episode, but I, I don't know what's going to happen with you next. Right. Uh, well, the promo pictures, I know two promo pictures just got released. One is of Tigress and one is of Barbara, Amy's character. And if you look at the Tigress photo, it's pretty clear where she is. Okay. So... Without, yes, you're right, without giving anything away, I will say that's a pretty good teaser. I mean, to see that, <laughs> I love seeing Tigress in a domestic setting. I think it's really funny. Yeah. And um, I will say that what happens there was a lot of fun. The, the other thing I really appreciate about the show is uh, your characters are introduced earlier on. You know, Sportsmaster came on very beginning. I think the first episode, he just introduced himself as just the, the, the gym owner. and it, you will yeah. gradually tease out your other identity as opposed to just shoving a new character in our face. Oh, here's another bad guy. So uh, it is interesting right. to see how that's teased out like that. So, Yeah, I think the writing team and Jeff had a very clear vision about how they wanted things to unfold. And it, that takes a lot of restraint because I think it would be very easy to just be like, exactly like you said, just like, Bleh, here's everyone and here's, we're thrusting all the characters at you. But I think that's not giving an audience any credit. You know, I mean, and I think for me, especially now, I, first of all, I love that the show is unfolding week to week. I love that it's not bingeable. I love that we have to wait because I don't know about you, but I need something to look yeah, forward no, to. Not <laughs> stuck, there's nothing left. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, because nowadays I could binge and do anything. So I, I'm really grateful that that's that format. And then, like you said, that the storyline is unfolding in a gradual way that makes you really hang on every single scene and every single moment, not take anything for granted. So, so yeah, I mean, believe me, it was hard for me and Neil in the beginning because our characters were introduced, but in these little pieces. You could tell and something so, might happen, but you had no idea where it was going. So yeah, which was a, such an effective way to build tension, right? Yeah. So when you did see that massive fight in episode six, it was such a rewarding thing to experience. I mean, for me too, you know, we had, I think to the day, Neil and I were texting each other and I think it was bit like literally a year since we had shot that when it oh, aired. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Cause it was over father's day weekend. Cause I remember Neil got on a plane and flew home after we shot that, um, burying the coach scene, which yeah. we shot at I think really five in the morning. Man. That was when I was kind of like, oh, these are, these are nasty, nasty folks. <laughs> we read the episode and looked at each other. We were like, we, we just, we just kill him. Like, we were like, he didn't, okay, he didn't okay. daughter, so we're going to kill him. What? <laughs> yeah, and then he's, you know, clearly just like the third one. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no restraint. I, I do love the over the top, but then the groundedness of the show. I mean, you got that and then yes. you've got real drama and, and kind of realistic. Yeah. But yeah, that, that yeah. was kind of my, oh my goodness moment of that episode when they did Me that. Me too. Me too. <laughs> We're going to threaten him or something, but nope, went a little further than that. <laughs> no, just a uh, dark parking lot. Here's my bat. Yeah, no, it was, <laughs> it was brutal. Brutal. So I'm going to try to shift gears on that uh, horrible transition to your other project that you mentioned. Sure. I think an animated series called Duncanville. Yes. Can you talk to us about, tell us a little bit about that project. 
So it couldn't be more opposite. Than yeah, this. it's like, it's like how do I make this transition work? <laughs> and it's not easy. <laughs> no, I think you just have to go like you did. Um, what was kind of amazing is that I shot them concurrently. So I would fly to Atlanta to do an episode of Stargirl and then shoot back to LA to do an episode of Duncanville. And um, it was really, I've never had this experience of uh, playing, of course, either of these characters, but to do a super villain one day and then literally the next day be a five-year-old <laughs> yeah. uh, was odd sometimes, um, but the best kind of odd. It was so much fun. And again, I the opportunity to work with the caliber of people in both shows, you know, Duncanville is helmed by veterans in this business. And that goes a long way toward creating an environment that is super creative and supportive so that you as an actor feel like you can come in and do your best. There's, there was no anxiety. I remember the very first table read for Duncanville. There's, you know, 40, 50 executives, high-powered people, sitting in a giant conference room at a giant table. They're surrounding you. You're all, you know, I'm sitting next to Amy Poehler right there. And, you know, no legit. pressure. Yeah. yeah, no pressure. But there was never a moment of anxiety. It was always just fun and supportive and that meant that uh we could do our best and so you know mike scully and julie thacker scully they kind of know what they're doing yeah uh you know they've had some practice a little bit so yeah a little bit so um it was really a lucky a lucky environment to find myself in so, so much fun give us the elevator summary elevator pitch on what is duncanville and just give us maybe the one-liner on you mentioned you're a five-year-old give us what is Duncanville <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a blurb and what is your role in, a, in another blurb so duncanville follows a very normal teenager in a very normal family who has an extremely specific fantasy life <laughs> like <laughs> which i think most teenagers and certainly any adults can relate to but yeah his fantasies are very funny very vivid but he's, you know, he's stuck in a, in a place where he's learning to drive and it's a small town and, and, you know, his adventures with his friends are like going out into the woods and blowing up televisions. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not that. And, um, That's as exciting my, as it is. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And my character, I always think of her as sort of the race, uh, the eye of the storm in this sometimes very chaotic family. And she's five, but she is often the voice of reason, which I think is really funny. And they always write her in a way that, um, <laughs> that exceeds my expectations of who she is. And, um, the most recent episode that we, we recorded has a really, oh my God, has a really funny little through line for her that um, I was surprised by. And I think that's a really lovely thing as an actor, if you can be continually surprised by the writing for your character, it's really um, stimulating. Do you have a special voice that you use or just use your regular voice? Or do you well, I, high, high I high do high. my... Yeah, I do my version of five years old, which again, I have to thank my children who, my youngest children are three and four. My oldest child is a 19 year old stepdaughter. And, but I do remember her voice when she was that age. So I'm surrounded by it in stereo. So it, that also was not terribly hard to access. So you've got five year old on one hand and crazy super villain slash mom on the other hand. Which role is easy, and you're doing them both at the same time, which role is easier for you to slide into and inhabit, or is it both the same level of dexterity required? Honestly, they're both pretty easy to access. I'm not sure what that says about me. Yeah, she is not a psychopath, but she does not kill no, people. No, <laughs> but you know, anyone who has a five-year-old can also say that, that five, year, five years old has its own kind of psychopath quality to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, again, I have to give credit to the writers on both sides because it would have been really easy just to demonize Paula. But with every single supervillain in the show, there's a reason. And I love that. There's a very human reason. So it's not just like they're the two-dimensional evil character they're they're motivated by deeper things um and for for jing and duncanville <laughs> i mean it's such a pleasure to play a child because there's no limits you know children don't have filters they don't see the world in terms of where they can't go they're just like it's wide open full of possibility so both roles have been very liberating for me in different ways uh where and how can people watch duncanville 
Duncanville, I think, is available on Hulu. I think you can also watch it via the Fox.com site, possibly. Okay. Um, and I know they're replaying it a ton, especially since now we've moved into season two. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's out there, and you can you can catch you can it easily. It I think you can yes, see it yes. the end of the spectrum. Um, yes. So I want to shift to something probably a little bit more topical, and, and and see what your perspective is on it, and that's the subject of representation in Hollywood. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things I personally like about Stargirl is it has characters from diverse backgrounds, but it really doesn't make it a thing. It's just that's yes. who they are. Um, yes. It just treats them like people. And I don't know if that's just expert writing or just casting or whatever, but I really appreciate that. But what are your thoughts on representation in Hollywood? And have you seen any changes in how roles are cast? I mean, it, yes, there have definitely been some changes. I feel like it's fairly glacial in terms of how it's changing. There, there are these spikes in activity when certain projects come to the forefront, come to attention, that where diversity and casting is really a beautiful thing, or there's an all Asian cast, say, and it's never about being Asian. And so those moments are wonderful, and I'm glad they get attention. However, they are still vastly in the minority. And um, again, the the I can mention crazy rich Asians off the top exactly, of my head. Exactly. Yes. Probably not a good thing, right? <laughs> I mean, it's good it happened. Yeah, but no, you. But you're right. You're right. It's. I mean, it's a dual-edged sword, right? On the one hand, it's like, yes, finally, wonderful, and I loved that movie, and I loved that it was a romantic comedy, and it just happened to be peopled with Asians. But uh, like that didn't. That didn't even really occur to me. But you, yes, the fact that that was an anomaly that we were all like, woo, what's a yeah. big deal? We did it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, almost. I mean, if we can get to the point where, I mean, I, I watch a show like Sex Education on Netflix, which is an amazing show, and that is also an extremely diverse cast. And I love that I don't even, it doesn't occur to me, though, that it's diverse uh, right away. And then I'm like, oh, my God, this is really an evolution. And I think with Stargirl as well, yes, the fact that, there is such a diverse cast and it's not a focus. Like it's never addressed that, uh, you know, that Croc and Paula are uh, a mixed couple and that they have a biracial, it's, that's just a fact. And guess what? That exists everywhere a, a lot of the time. I, I am that. Yeah. So, uh, so um, for me, um, we still have a long way to go. Uh, so these kinds of things are just taken for granted and that they're status quo and that, um, that a point of reference is not one that is automatically white and then deviates from that. You know, I would like, I would like the first point of reference to be something else. <laughs> have, have so you, in your experience, I know you mentioned it's been a glacial change, but have you seen I don't know, the effects of lack of representation or, or maybe people trying to be a little bit more inclusive in your own casting experience? Yeah. You know, I, I have a question, but I think you get what I'm saying. I think so. And, and, and feel free to divert me if I'm going off track. Um, I think for me, I have been relatively lucky in my experience here. Um, you know, when I came to LA, I was a little bit older than I think a lot of people are. My, my career started for me at a time in my life where I had already I graduated from college years ago. I'd had multiple years being out in a workforce, like a nine to five workforce. So when I went back to school for acting, I was, in a, I was in a headspace where I was very focused and I, I had more sense of who I was. And so when I came to LA, I was not of the mindset of like, I'll do anything. I, I went to my first agent and I said, here's what I absolutely don't want. You know, I don't want to be typecast in these kinds of roles. So if you see those, please don't even consider me because I'm not interested. And I've absolutely turned down auditions that I felt like kind of fell into some of those categories that might have been major opportunities. But for me, that wasn't what I wanted to look back on as something that I did. Now, every actor is going to do things that they don't love. And that's because they feed themselves and or <laughs> their families. But um but I do believe that uh, most of the time you, you can make a choice and that is different for everybody. And so when I have turned down an audition, I'm like, I'm sure some very talented person will get that role and have fun doing it. It's just, that wasn't for me. Amy Poehler actually has this great saying about parenthood, about being a mom that I apply to everything. And that's like, great for her, not for me. And, you know, I am in no position to judge anyone else's journey. And as an Asian American actor, it is hard enough. 
Yeah. <laughs> like we just need to support each other and be there for each other so that when we do challenge the status quo, we feel like we're doing it as, as a community, not just as one lone voice that's having to stand up against the masses. Um, but yeah, I think things have gotten better. I think it's really good how now in casting they're striving for, um, for an integrity and uh, a mirroring of the truth, which is great. Um, like I, I've turned down voiceover auditions that are for ethnicities that are not my own. I just don't feel like that's, that's a, a good choice for me. It's not authentic. And it, that role should go to a, a black woman. Like I, I, what do I know about portraying a black woman? I do nothing. So, um, yeah, again, it's a personal choice, but I do feel a, a responsibility to make choices like that. And um, I feel nothing but good about doing that and, um, and making sure everyone is getting a chance to represent themselves, which would be, which would be nice. Well, I have to say, I've really appreciated talking to you. This has been very informative. I always try to end on kind of an off the wall question since we've made it through yeah. all this stuff. I have to ask you what you can tell me about working on Alvin and the Chipmunks, the squeeze <laughs> where you played airline rep. Uh, because that is that's one of those movies that literally I don't know if anyone has seen, but like everyone knows the Squeakquel. So what can you tell yeah. me about your Squeakquel time? Well, it was such a gift actually because I'd worked with the director before, and she called me up. She's like, "Hey, you want to come do a day on my movie?" And I was like, "Yes." I didn't know what it was. I was like, "Of course, I'll come." And then I was like, "Oh, it's a oh." And then I spent that day acting with a tennis ball, which I. <laughs> which I'd never done before. It was really hard. And, um, but that was sort of my first jump into special effects. And it was to pretend a tennis ball was a chipmunk running up and down someone's body. And I just remember thinking, this is my life. I, this is what I do. I made it. I'm an actress. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Well, it definitely felt like a rite of passage. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the thing, my personal joke on this is that there's two movies that are etched in my brain because of their title alone, The Squeakquel and Breakin' 2 Electric Boogaloo. So oh. those, both those names just kind of resonate with me. So you're kind of I, in the you, pantheon. You just made me flash back to my youth. I loved Breakin' 2. Oh, my <laughs> God. I was obsessed with those movies. But you're not allowed to say Breakin' 2. You have to say it all together. Breakin' 2 Electric Boogaloo. Electric Boogaloo. Boogaloo. You're right. <laughs> Would you agree that's you're the right. greatest name for a movie ever? I mean, except for the ones I you're mean, <laughs> No, but you're right. It never it never leaves you. And you're right. You can't really say one part without thinking of the other. <laughs> and that's a that's a stroke of genius yeah, on their part. I don't know if they ever made any other titles, but they've got a gift. So, <laughs> so I, just wanna, I just want to thank you for your time. You've been a wonderful person to talk to. And hopefully the future is bright for Tigress, so we can maybe have another uh, season two chat, but I don't know if you're going to make it or not. We'll have to see what happens later on in the season. I know, spoiler free. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to talk again soon. 